All right, good job, everybody, that participated. Thank you. Um, let me pray for us, and then we'll get started with our topic today. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Uh, God, uh, thank you for creating us. Uh, as we learned about last week, Lord, you created us in your image. And so, God, we uh, are, are so thankful um, for creating us the way that you did. Uh, God, even though um, we failed, uh, and we're going to talk about that today, God, we know that you love us. Um, and so we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, again, last week, last week we talked about that we are created in the image of God, right? Now, that's good news, but today we get to cover some less good news, um, some kind of bad news, right? So if you have your Bibles, um, and I'm going to have the passage up here in a second for you, but um, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. All right, Genesis chapter 3, I think we've got those... Um, Verses 17 through 20 should be in your notes as well if you don't have your Bible. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just read that and follow along. It says, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Okay, so, as we already said, we were created in God's image. Right? We, we talked about that last week. Um, but man sinned, right? We, we know the story, and we'll get into that a little bit more in a second. But first of all, created, man was created, and as such, who knows the term federal headship? All right, not a lot of people. To me, that's kind of a newer term, federal headship. It's in your notes, but if you can think about it, who is man's federal head. All right, I'll give you the definition. Federal headship is a chief representative, something that would be much like a king over his citizens, as it's in your notes there. I looked it up, it said federal headship refers to the representation of a group united under a federation or covenant. For example, a country's president may be seen as a federal headship over their nation, representing and speaking on its behalf before the rest of the world. So that part's key, representing and speaking on its behalf. So as humans, our federal head is who? Right, we think, right, I think God, that's the first thing that came to my mind too, but our federal headship as humans, our human Adam. federal headship is Adam. Yeah, our human federal headship is Adam, right? Because he was the first created and so basically set the tone for and speaks and represented us as human beings. So, yes, it's initially Adam. So, if you think back, we talked about it again last week that God created man. But if you listen, if you look at the, the creation account, all the different days with. with Maybe not including day one or day two, but every other day God creates something and he looks and he says, what? It's good. Yeah, God saw that it was good. In fact, it's in verse uh, 10 and 12 and 18 and 21 and 25 of chapter one that God said, God looked and saw that it was good. But after he creates man and he looks back over all that he's created, now what does he say? Does he say that it's good? It's very good. Yeah, God looks back and says that it's very good. That's good news for us, right? Because God created something that's different than everything else that he created. He created something in his own image. He created us. And then he looks back and says, it's very good because we're created 
differently than the rest of cre cre creation and the rest of the creatures that were created. However, um, different from all the creation or creatures, right? We're created in his image. But God put within us, again, differently than all other creatures that he created. He put within us a moral compass or morality. Okay? He put within us, um, what do you put it as? Uh, morality. Yeah, morality. Okay? So God with the ability to know the difference between right and wrong. And then the ability, therefore, also to choose right or wrong. Right? Who, who's got animals here, pets? Right? How many, how many of your animals or pets um, do things that you aren't super thrilled that they do? After telling them time and time and time again not to do those things. Stop peeing on my shoes. Or stop tearing up my couch. Right? Whatever it is. We can't, like, hold them to, like, knowing exactly, because they're just, they're not, they're a creature that God created not in his image and not necessarily with a code of morality. Similarly, um, you guys may know somebody that doesn't believe in God, that doesn't know God, but has, still has a moral compass because they were created in God's image. Right? I know a guy who claims to be agnostic, doesn't believe that there's a God. However, he's a very moral person, right? Business-wise, he treats people the right way. He's a, he's a fair and kind person to other people. But there's that morality that's built in. But again, there's that choice that initially we had in Adam of choosing between right and wrong. That's that free will, okay? Um, again, that's that moral nature that God puts within each of us. And why did God give us this? Because he wanted us to be able to see and to hear and to read his word and to listen to what he has to say and choose to obey. All right, choose to obey. It wouldn't, he didn't want to create something that would just, you know, do exactly what he said because he told them to do it. He wanted us, he wants you and I to be able to choose to do the right thing. So again, just prior to the passage that we read, is the account of man's sin, right? We know the story that Satan leveraged against us this idea of being like God, right? He preyed upon Adam and Eve and leveraged that free will that God gave us against us, suggesting that if we place ourselves in opposition to God, that we might become like God. So I want to, three things about sin. I want to tell you three things about sin. These aren't in your notes, but three things about sin that I think is helpful to, to remember. All right? Because just because we hear that, like, we're all sinful, that, God, that Adam sinned, therefore brought sin into the world, and therefore we are under that, it doesn't mean that God thinks of our sin as anything less serious than that initial sin, right? God takes sin very seriously. First thing I want to know about sin is that sin always works by tricking or deceiving us into <clears throat> doubting things that are true or believing things that are false. All right? Sin always tricks us or deceives us into doubting things that are true or believing things that are false. So again, like, God's word helps us to know what is right and what is wrong, to try to ward against falling into sin and temptation. Right? God's given us, if we are a child of his, he's put within us his Holy Spirit to guide us toward being able to choose between that right or that wrong. All right. Secondly, sin is lived out through turning from God and his ways in order to do what we think is best. All right, sin happens when we turn from what God says and we do what we want. How, how many people here are selfish? All right, I didn't see every hand, so how many of the rest of your hands go up when I ask if you're a liar? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, I mean, like, I'm selfish. I think we are all selfish. We want to do what we want to do, right? Like, that's, that's what sin is, is that we 
constantly are being pulled away from what God says and what's right and what's good to do what we think is what's right and what's good. What we think is best for us. The third thing about sin is that sin always results in harm, ruin, and death. Sin, sin always results in harm, ruin, and death. Now, I know that sounds heavy, that, and, it, and it is, right? This week, we're talking about our sin nature. Fortunately, next week, we have a little bit better news to, to rise up to. And I think you'll, we'll, we'll hit that before the end of the day. Um, all right, in your notes, the next thing in your notes is another heavy line, all right? And it says, therefore, by sinning, Adam, in a sense, declared war on God. In turn, since we are under the federal headship of Adam, we are also at war with God, the government at the bottom. That's a, that's, a, that's a heavy line to say that you're at war with God. Right? Like, I like to think of it as, yeah, we're in opposition to God. We're at odds with God because of our sin. All right, again, strong language. If you have your Bible, um, I'm going to turn to Romans 5, 12 through 19. If you've got your Bible, you can turn there with me or you can write it down in your notes. Romans 5, 12 through 19. This is titled, Death Through Adam, Life Through Christ. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. So, I'm sorry, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who do not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern, pattern to the of the one to come. I think I got one more verse here. No, nope. couple more. But the gift is it is the gift is not like the trespass. For if, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? See, now we're getting into the good news. But first of all, that truth is that. We are under the federal headship of Adam, meaning we are all sinners. Right? Just like it says in Romans 12, or I mean, sorry, Romans 5, verse 12, is that through Adam sin entered the world. Therefore, we are under sin. What is how does that make you feel? I want you to turn to your table for a quick second and talk about what do you what do you think about this truth? How does it make you feel to know that you're in opposition or you're at war? with God. All right, turn to your table and just talk about that for a quick second. How does it feel to know your opposition to God? Did you die? Yes. What kind of batteries are those? Double A's? Yep. Does this pop open? How does this one work? Oh, okay. Ours has a thing that like... Yeah, we, we get the leftovers. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes. It's a good time to let it die, though. Yeah. I was like, am, is anything coming out of this? It's good. It should work for you now. Sweet. Thank you. Okay, what were some of the answers that were given at your table? I think I heard somebody say, well, that was a really good answer, so I want to hear it. What, is, what, is, what does it mean to you knowing that you're in opposition with God? I heard. Scared. Scared. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I feel like it's impossible to win a war against God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. Impossible to win a war. Yes. Uh, it's like kind of weird because he loves you, but it's also kind of confusing. A little bit scary. A little confusing, a little scary, yeah. Wrong. Wrong. Okay. 
Anybody else? Yeah. To be to think that you're in opposition to God or at war with God, that's a those are again, that's heavy language. But um, to to press further into that, I guess, let's look at a few verses that I think they're in your notes. Um, if I can get a few people who's got who have Bibles to look up these verses, then I'm gonna take the mic around and, and have you guys uh, read them out loud for us. Who can look up Psalm 14, verse 3 for me? Why? So you're in verse Romans 3, 23. Yeah? Yeah. Romans 3, Romans 3, 23, okay? Uh, Romans 6, 23. Okay, Gibson. Romans 7, 14 through 20. This is a longer passage. Okay, you got Romans 7, 14 through 20. Gibson, Romans 6, 23. We're going to start with why? Psalm 14, verse 3. They have all turned aside together. They have come corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. All right. None who have done good, not even one. Psalm 14.3. So what is Psalm 14.3? We've all turned away. We've all become corrupt. Right? We can't say, hey, that was Adam or that was Eve that did those things. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done those things. I, I'm not a sinner. It's not me. It was them. No, we all. It says, no one is does good, not even one. All right, and then we've got, uh, was it Romans 3, 23? Would you like the mic? Sure. Sweet. For all we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes. All right, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah, we're, we're called to glorify God. But we don't do that so well through our sin, right? We all have sinned. Romans 6, 23. That was Gibson. <coughs> For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes, we're starting to hit to, toward the good news there, right? The wages of sin is death. Yeah. The wages of that sin. We have all sinned and deserve death. Right? But, there's the good news. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Alright, uh, Romans 7, 14 through 20. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Yeah, there's a lot of do and not do and all that. But, and even, in fact, if you guys were in the first service, um, one of the, I think, gals who was baptized this morning referenced this, right? Of the, we, we don't do what we want to do, we end up doing what we know we are not supposed to do because of that sin that's living within us. And he, he made, it made reference in that passage to the, there's no good in me, right? It's that, that slave to sin. The good does not dwell in us. Um, and so because of that sin that's in us, um, what does that do to the relationships that we have? How does that affect our relationships? Our relationship with God, our relationships with each other, our relationship with creation. Those, are, those should be in your notes um, so you can follow along. But what, what does our man and God relationship look like? Through the fall, the relationship between man and God is broken. All right? Through the fall, the relationship between man and God is broken. We talked before about how God, who God is, right? And in our last segment, 
and like all the good and the great things about him, his characteristics. But man, to, to know that we sinned and therefore are separated from God because of that sin, like initially, like that's, that's a lot to be separated from. Right, I'm going to read another quick passage from Luke 16, 23 to 26. This is um, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Now listen to how serious this separation is. Luke 16, 23 to 26. Well, actually, I'm going to read the whole... Yeah, I'll read the rest of it, 23. Um, in Hades, where he was tormented, it's talking about uh, this, this... I'm going to start from the beginning so we can get context, sorry. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was, a, was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus, the beggar, by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. See, this sin has created a chasm right, that separates us from God. Again, remembering we're, we're still getting to the good news. All right, so again, that separation, you can hear the seriousness of that separation. What does it do to our relationship with each other? Right? Man and man relationship. Through the fall, same thing. Through the fall, the relationship between man and man is broken. Who remembers what Adam does immediately after they sin? Jesus, yeah, they're hiding from God. And God said, hey, what, what did you do? Why are you hiding? And what, what does Adam do? He blames it on Eve. Not a good thing to do, is it, fellas? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. No, but he that relationship is broken between man and man. He's like, he he throws her under the bus. Right? Like our sin causes a break in our relationship with each other. Before this, I gotta imagine that he and Eve's relationship was was perfect before sin, right? They lived in perfect harmony with one another. And he says, the woman you put here with me, she gave me something, some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Genesis 3.15 says then, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between her offspring and yours. See, that sin created a break in the relationship between man and woman, or man and man, right? Okay, so the third one there, the relationship of, between man and creation. Same thing through the fall, through the fall, the relationship between man and creation is broken. Jesus, or God created this, and through Jesus, but God created the, the, the garden, right? The garden of Eden, which was this beautiful, perfect place. And what happens after sin? Do they get to stay there and enjoy that garden? No, they're banished. They're kicked out. Right? That's part of that creation that was created for them, but because of that sin, they're banished from the garden. And then it says, we already read it this morning, it says, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you're going to work it, right? Until you return to that ground, right? There's this break in creation. So what is your human nature? It's in your notes. What is your human nature? It's broken. It's sinful. It's depraved. Those are all 
heavy words. We've been talking about a lot of heavy things today because of sin. I want you to remember that sin, like I sometimes forget how serious my sin is. Right again, I mentioned it already this morning that like I can easily be like, well, it's, it's Adam's fault that sin is in the, like, no, it's, it's, it's our fault. We are sinners. So my human nature is broken, sinful, and depraved. Depravity means moral corruption and wickedness. So there's a question in there. And there's everyone depraved. Is everyone depraved? Is everyone morally corrupt and wicked? What's the answer, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Yes, everyone is depraved. So the final thing, though, we get to start to look toward that hope. I think David gave me this week because he doesn't like to be a bearer of bad news. <laughs> David probably could take over the, the hope that we hear next week. But what is the hope? What, what hope is there? It's that Jesus becomes our new federal head. Right? We talked about that in the beginning, that the, our, our federal head, some people said God, and that's not far off, right? But originally it was Adam brought sin, so therefore we're all sinful. But Jesus comes down and becomes then our federal head. You can write down, Jesus becomes our new federal head when we're saved and makes us new. Jesus becomes our new federal head. Praise God. That's good news, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes.